I appreciate it. I th thank you, everyone, for uh, being here tonight. I really uh, appreciate it. Uh, I, I feel a little bit like an airline pilot and, and uh, telling you that I know you have choices, and so thank you for flying Southwest. Um, there's a, there are at least three other events going on tonight about economic justice, poverty, and human rights. Uh, I think that says a lot about the community that we live in in Durham, uh, how much we care about this, these issues and are engaged with them. It also says a lot of, uh, about um, the state of the, the country that these are still issues that we're talking about, right? Um, but I really appreciate you being here. I also want to you know, thank the regulator and Tom um, for, for having me here. It means a, a, a lot to launch the book uh, here. Uh, we moved to Durham in 2002. Uh, I, I started the graduate program in the history department at Duke um, the fall of 2002. And I had heard about the regulator before even moving to Durham uh, from other folks in uh, the academy and, and, and people who knew history and, and uh, just loved to read. So uh, I came here as an avid reader. Uh, I had bought my books here. And now as, a, as someone who teaches at Duke in the writing program, I uh, order my textbooks through here. So if there's anybody who is a, uh, an academic here who does not order their textbooks through the regulator, you should. Um, and you can see Tom um, for that. So it, it means a lot uh, to, to be here tonight and, and, and to, to start this year. So um, I, you know, as, the plan, as Tom said, the plan will be you know, to talk for 35 or 40 minutes um, at the most. I'll do some reading from yeah, the book uh, over here. And, uh, and then I, I look forward to a robust dialogue, questions and answers at the end for you know, the next you know, 20 or 25 minutes after that until around 8 o'clock. And then I'll sign some books over there, you know, whoever wants to, if they can read my chicken scratch, right? Um, so uh, so that's, the, that's the plan. So this year we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of a number of civil rights flashpoints. Uh, 1963 was a, was, a, was a pretty important year in the civil rights movement. Um, and, uh, or what I will call the black freedom struggle for the, the rest of the talk. And none will be more celebrated um, than the March on Washington that happened on August 28, 1963. Um, I think we can imagine that the focus will be, you know, this is, this is probably what we're, gonna see, what we're gonna see a lot of, right, Dr. King, uh, the celebrity of Dr. King uh, and I have a dream speech, right? Uh, maybe there will be some mention of the complexity of the March on Washington, the labor unions and the labor activists who actually made it possible, who actually did all the organizing like Bayard Rustin. Uh, maybe we'll hear about the full name of the March on Washington, which was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, and maybe we'll even hear about the Kennedy administration's horror about this about this march. They didn't want this to happen. They were concerned um, that it would just lead to violence to the point where uh, President Kennedy shut down the federal government other than a, uh, for essential personnel the day that this occurred in 63. But I'm pretty certain that the commemoration is mostly going to focus on Dr. King and I have a dream. And, and you know, I know that you know, we all know the speech. I'm sure most of us can recite parts of it, large chunks of it, uh, especially toward the end. And you know it's a great it's a great speech. It's optimistic. It's hopeful. It's King at his best when it comes to um, the delivery and the cadence and the style and the emotional appeal of it. Um, but it also freezes Dr. King in 1963 in this moment, right? Uh, he's talking about equality and brotherhood, which are which are which are fine uh, themes and fine a fine message. But it it freezes him and obscures the complexity of King obscures the complexity of the black freedom struggle, and it obscures the complexity of the 1960s. So tonight I want to talk more um, about another march, uh, the Poor People's Campaign in 1968, which is what Dr. King was working on when he was assassinated in Memphis. Alarmed by what he saw as a vicious circle of violence uh, by the state, both police harassment and, and brutality, um, or, uh, as well, U.S. military involvement in Southeast Asia, and then the response by frustrated African Americans, at, uh, very frustrated at the slow pace of change and civil rights change, particularly in urban areas in the North and West. Dr. King despaired in late 1967 that he thought the United States was moving quickly toward a fascist, you know, toward, a, toward fascism, toward a fascist state. That the inevitable response to the violence that's occurring. 
um, both by the police and rioters, and in, and what the, you know, the signal, the the, uh, the the symbolism of Vietnam was sending was that uh, this was quickly was quickly turning into um, turning toward fascism, right? Um, and so in December uh, of 1967, he announces the Poor People's Campaign, in which his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which I'll refer to as the SELC the rest of the talk, would bring, quote, waves of the nation's poor and disinherited to Washington, D.C., to demand redress of their grievances by the government and to secure at least jobs or income for all, adding that the poor would stay until America responds. But he envisioned this campaign as not just black and white, but one that included Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Native Americans as well. And he had hoped that the campaign would do a number of things, three, three primary goals. Transform fully the struggle of civil rights, the struggle of human rights. Um, bring about the federal government's uh, rededication to the war on poverty, a war on poverty that was declared four years earlier by President Lyndon Johnson, uh, but never fully fought, never fully funded and to hopefully restore the credibility of nonviolence in social, uh, in social justice organizing, right, uh, which had lost ground uh, considerably amid the calls uh, for any means necessary uh, and uh, armed self-defense, particularly uh, through the black power movement. So I'm going to lead, lead to my, my first excerpt here um, that in some ways uh, captures you know, why, the, why I think the campaign is so important and how it's been treated up to this point, really, by most scholars and, and uh, the public memory. The crusade blossomed into the most ambitious campaign ever undertaken by King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The campaign, which King did not live to see, has been dismissed by journalists, scholars, King biographers, and even some activists as either irrelevant or a disastrous coda of the black freedom struggle. One former SCLC official referred to the campaign as the, quote, little bighorn of the civil rights movement, an eye-catching but rather imprecise analogy because it's not clear who, um, who the Lakota and who General Custer are in that analogy, right? Um, and in fact, the campaign was deeply flawed in many ways and often was preoccupied with symbolism. It did not spark a new war on poverty. It did not reinvigorate nonviolent strategy, and it did not achieve many of SCLC's stated goals including a New Deal-style jobs program. Yet a closer look at the campaign reveals a unique and remarkably instructive experiment to build a multiracial movement designed to wage a sustained fight against poverty. Even amid the cacophony of assassinations and political turmoil that spring, the campaign captured the nation's attention and imagination. Only in Washington in the spring of 1968 did local, regional, and national activists of so many different backgrounds, from veterans of the labor and southern civil rights movements to activists of the newer Chicano, American Indian, any war and welfare rights struggles, attempt to construct a physical and spiritual community explicitly about justice and poverty that went beyond a one-day rally. By bringing such a diverse array of activists together from across the country, the campaign highlighted how multiracial, coalitional politics operate alongside the identity politics of black and Chicano power. That relationship was messy at times and exacerbated by other forces, but ultimately activists such as Reyes Tiarina, Martin Luther King, Corky Gonzalez and Jesse Jackson, Maria Varela and Marion Wright, and thousands of others did not choose either identity politics or coalitional politics at this time. They chose both and participated in both. So this last part, and I'll I'll, you know, most of those names I think are, are recognizable. A few of them I'll, I'll explain a little bit. Um, this last part, this relationship between coalition and identity or class and race is central to the book. The public memory uh, and most scholars still break down the 1960s uh, into two pieces. Uh, the decade is seen as the good 1960s and the bad 1960s, right? So the good 1960s are, you know, the, the moment of Kennedy liberalism, right, and the early civil rights coalition uh, that is uh, uh, most active uh, in the early 1960s up to 1964, 65. But then this coalition, and this is how the narrative is normally told, then this coalition devolves into conflict, urban uprisings, black power, and identity politics. And so in reality, what I argue is, is that coalition and conflict are always in coexistence, right? There isn't this declension narrative 